what, what I want to do this morning, you know, last week I did, but two weeks prior to that, we were in our series that we call Me First. All right? Now, w- what I mean by that, and I'm just running over this again just so that somebody that might be in the room that hasn't been here understands what I'm talking about when I say Me First. I'm not talking about selfish people. That's not what I'm talking about. God's not called us to be selfish. Amen? I mean, he's just not called us to be selfish. He's called us to humble ourselves. And a person with a me-first attitude is somebody who says, I'll step up to the plate. I'll go first. I will do what God's called me to do if nobody else will do it. That's what I mean when I say me-first. And so far, we've looked at the idea that those who have a me-first mindset are humble enough to serve, right? They're humble enough to serve. But not only are they humble enough to serve, but they are also willing enough to go. They take the gospel from the church house and they go all out into the world preaching the gospel. Now let me say this because I want you to hear my heart. I am so appreciative of people that are humble enough to serve and go with the gospel. Understand this, if we didn't have people like that in the world today, the gospel would not get to the nations. Right? The gospel would not get to your kids maybe or your grandkids. We need people who are humble enough to go with the gospel of Jesus into a lost and dying world. So I for one would like to say today that I praise God for people who will go with the gospel. Amen? I'm just grateful for that. And so we, see, we saw that over the last couple of days, but he, a couple of weeks. But here's what I want you to also understand. If you live a me-first mindset, you need to understand that there will be moments when you'll be wounded for the gospel. Amen? I mean, you you take the gospel out into the world. Uh, Listen, even sometimes you're you're steadfast, rock-solid in the gospel. Even in the middle of the church house, sometimes you'll be wounded because of the gospel. And here's what I know about being wounded for the gospel. When we, when we are wounded from the gospel, sometimes for the gospel, sometimes we respond and react differently. Maybe your wound is that somebody ridiculed you because you were a Jesus follower. Maybe your work associates, they, they made fun of you and they mocked you. Or maybe they labeled you as one of those people who's, oh, I think that they must think they're so much better than everybody else because they trust in Jesus Christ. I guess they think they little Miss Perfect or little Mr. Perfect out there. Maybe you've been labeled like that because you're going with the gospel of Jesus. Maybe sometimes people judge you more harshly because you are a follower of Jesus. Or maybe that you've been hurt emotionally or even physically because you're going with the gospel of Jesus. Now look, we can look in the Bible and we see that all day long. Amen? People that went with the gospel were hurt all the time because of their faith in the gospel. Now I'm going to make a statement. I want you to listen to this statement. So look at your neighbor and say, you need to pay attention to this. I I don't want you to fear this statement. I want you to hear this statement. You got it? Don't fear it, but hear it. Here's the statement. As you go with the gospel, you may have to bleed for the gospel. As you go with the gospel, you may have to bleed for the gospel. Uh, Listen, sometimes whenever you go with the gospel, you get hurt. You get wounded. And here's what I know and understand personally about myself sometimes, and probably you as well, When we get hurt, even if it's for the gospel, sometimes we tend to respond in bitterness, don't we? Man, we get get bitter. Sometimes folks, they've gotten hurt within the church or they've gotten hurt by a Christian person who didn't respond right and they got bitter and they stayed out of the house of God for years because they're still letting that bitterness control their life. But sometimes that happens if we're not careful. We'll get bitter. Sometimes not even bitter. Sometimes we just get angry. I mean, we just get angry whenever we're wounded because of the gospel's sake. And sometimes it's, it's deeper than anger. We're not just angry. Sometimes we want to get revenge. Amen? I tell you what, they hurt me. I hope something bad happens to them. You know, we, we, we get that way sometimes if we're not careful when we get wounded for the sake of the gospel. We can hold a grudge. We can desire to get even. We can even become spiteful. Because we've been wounded for the gospel. But here's what I'm convinced of. And this is what I want you to key in on right now. I am convinced that a person. A person who is desperately desiring to have a me first mentality. A me first mindset. A me first lifestyle. They're doing their very, very best to guard against that temptation. 
They're doing their very best to guard against being bitter when they're wounded for the gospel. They're doing their very best to guard against being angry when they're wounded for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. You say, why would they be that way? Because they have the third characteristic of a, a me person, a first person, and that is this. They are faithful enough to forgive. I believe that people who have a me first mindset, a me first lifestyle, that are trying to live, putting themselves out there saying, I'll serve Jesus no matter what. I believe they're humble enough to serve other people. I believe that they, listen, I believe that they're willing to go with the gospel, but I also understand, uh, believe that they understand they're going to get hurt sometimes, but they're, they're faithful enough that they're going to forgive. They're going to forgive. Now, I cannot tell you how important forgiveness is. Some of you know very well what I'm talking about because you may have lived a, at a point in your life to where you couldn't forgive somebody. And, and listen, it done more harm to you than it did to them because that's what unforgiveness will do. It, it, listen, it, it's like uh, drinking poison expecting somebody else to die. That's what forgiveness does. And so forgiveness is a commodity that, or, or a treasure that you and I cannot afford to live without. Forgiveness is necessary if we're going to please God and win souls. Now, I'm going to say that again so you'll get it. Forgiveness is necessary if we are going to please God and win souls. Think, think about this. How many of y'all say, I, I love a good story? Anybody like story? I love story. I love telling stories. You know what I'm saying? I'm, that's why I like Jerry Clyer so much because he was a good storyteller. Amen? He didn't tell funny stories. He told stories funny. So don't you love people like that? Don't make no difference what the story is. They can tell it in a funny way. Well, I like that kind of stuff. And we love stories. That's, that's one reason why we can get so captivated with messages that are just filled with stories but no Bible because we love stories. Now, we got to be careful, but I'm going to tell you, I love good stories. And what I found over the years is um, that stories affect us in an emotional way. And some of the stories that affect us in some of the deepest emotional ways is stories about forgiveness. Now, don't you agree with that? When we hear those stories about forgiveness, doesn't it just do something to your heartstrings? I mean, just absolutely amazing. So I want to give you a couple stories real quick, real briefly, about forgiveness. This is a story uh, of an Episcopal church in Charleston, North Carolina, and a tragic thing that happened, a shooting that took place at that church Here's what the article said. It said, just days after the shooter ruthlessly took the lives of nine church members, family members of the victims remarkably began offering statements of forgiveness to him during the bond hearing. The daughter of Ethel Lance, one of the girls killed, fought through tears to speak directly to the man who shot her daughter. And here's what she said. She said this to him. Remarkable. You took something very precious away from me. Mm. She goes on to say, I'll never be able to talk to her again. I will never be able to hold her ever again. But I forgive you. Now you and I right now, we're, in our mind, we're like, wow. That's so awesome. But at the same time, we go, I don't know if I could have done it, but that's awesome. But stories like that, they grip our heart. Let me give you another one. There, this is a story of a man named Thomas Borg. He was a leader in the struggle against the totalitarian regime that had dominated his country in Nicaragua. And during the revolution, Borg was captured and he was put in prison. While there, while, while there he was subjected, listen to this, to the most extreme torture for 500 hours. 500 hours? I mean, some of y'all think it's torture to come in here for an hour. I mean, he's subjected to the extreme torture for 500 hours. And then after the revolution, Borg was freed, and he became the minister of interior to that country. So all of a sudden, now he's a big weed. And one day he was walking in prison for some reason. He was walking in the jail, and he saw one of the men in the jail that tortured him. Can you imagine all of the memories that come flooding back of the things that they've done to him for 500 hours? I, maybe they plucked his fingernails out. I, I don't know. They tortured him. And I'm sure that came flooding back. And so all of a sudden, he goes up to the man who did that to him, and he said, I'll have my revenge on you today. 
And he said, here's my revenge. And he stuck his hand out and said, I forgive you. Who does that? Seriously, who does that, man? I mean, think about that. But, but, but that's exactly what forgiveness is. And when we hear those stories, I read another story about a lady who uh, uh, her next door neighbor shot her son and killed her son. And he got in, ended up put in jail. And he stayed in jail for 20 years. And after 20 years, he was released from jail and moved right back in the same house with his family right next to her. And instead of her moving, what she did was she began to reach out to him. She began to try to build a relationship with him. And she ended up taking him in as her own son. Forgiveness is powerful. And so forgiveness and stories of forgiveness does something to our hearts. And no doubt about it, the Bible has called us to be people that forgive other people. But here's my question. And I just had to wrestle with this for just a little bit when I was studying it. Just how much do I need to forgive? You know, isn't that what we do? You know what I'm saying? I know the Bible says I'm supposed to forgive, but I'm just saying, how much? How much I got to forgive you if you do something ignorant to me all the time? Well, you're not in, listen, you're not alone in asking that question. Peter asked that question too. He asked that question of Jesus, and that's what I want us to see in this, in this text, where Jesus is there with his disciples, and Peter begins to ask this question of the Lord. Now, y'all all right? Everybody alive over here? Y'all alive on this side of the church over here? Just want to make sure. Y'all live over here on this side? All right. So, if, I mean, if y'all need me to sing a little tune, I'll bust one out. You know what I mean? I can't sing. I was over there singing this morning at the Marouge campus. I mean, I'm, I'm down there, and I'm just getting after it. You know, Brother Gary, and I'm just singing, you know, Lord. We done baptized. I'm feeling good about it. I'm just singing, boy. I'm just having myself a good time. And it was like the Lord spoke something to me. Y'all want to know what he spoke to me? Good. I'm going to tell you anyway, whether you want to hear it or not. I, 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 I just heard him say in my spirit, just keep worshiping. And then he said, listen, I ain't going to lie. Look at me. Look at me now. I sounded good. I sounded good. You know how I know? He told me. He told me it was good. And it had nothing to do with the way I sounded. Because he heard my heartbeat, not necessarily my voice. See, that eliminates anybody. I don't even know where this is going, but God bless you, whoever this is for. That eliminates you singing. Because it don't matter what you sound like, he wants to hear your heart. And sometimes your heart coming out your mouth is just so good to him. And he just said, he just he said, ooh, it sounds good. So look at your neighbor and say, next week, that's a command. Look at your neighbor and say, next week, you better be singing. Amen. All right, so let's look at this text. How much do I need to forgive? Matthew 18, 21. Let's look at it. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? How many of y'all feel like you forgave somebody seven times already? So the question is, and when you read the text and you look at it, the question is, why seven times? Well, I mean, why did he say seven times? All right, so I don't know. But I can give you some things that people think maybe why he said it. One, because seven is a complete number. It's a perfect number, right? The number seven. The religious leaders of that day said you need to at least forgive somebody three times. So he, we've got doubled plus one, perfect number. So maybe he's using that number because saying after seven times, then that ought to be good enough because, I mean, that's a perfect number. Right, Jesus? I mean, right? You know? Maybe it's because there's seven days in a week. And he's saying, you mess with me once a day and do something to me, I'm going to forgive you, and then I'm going to make my way away from you, so I only got to forgive you one time a day because I ain't going to be around you the rest of the day. Okay? Maybe that's it. Or maybe there was just speculation around there, and he's just throwing out a number, and I don't know why he said seven. But I know that he said to Jesus, if somebody sins against me, Jesus, just how many times do I have to say, it's all right, I forgive you? And Jesus answers and Jesus says this, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, I, you know, our immediate response, 490 times. 490 times. Well, listen, let's just be honest. Nobody's going to offend you 490 times. 
because you're going to get away from them before that's up. I'm, I, look at me now. Unless you live with them. <laughs> and this principle really does not apply because it actually means more than 490 times. And I'm going to show you that. But I, so I just want, for those of y'all right now, you husbands out there, you're going, I'm tired of it. She's at 489 right now. One more and I'm out. I'm moving up to the sanctuary. Just hold up. Hold up. So Jesus says to him, I say up, not up to seven times, but up to 77 times. I, 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 I just threw that in there because my wife's over here going. So I just want, I, I got the pulpit and I can say what I want. That's what I'm saying. So 70 times seven. Now, of course, Jesus is trying to imply that it's, it's more than that. He goes on to do what he does best. Jesus tells a story. Jesus was a master storyteller. He could tell a story and bring out a heavenly truth and help you understand it like nobody else. And so Jesus t attempts to explain forgiveness to the disciples and to Peter in this way. He says, therefore, because you need to forgive 70 times 7, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So, so, so you've got these servants that obviously owe the king. They owe the master. And the master says, it's, it's time to pay, right? It's, look at me now. It's kind of like a bill collector. When they send them, it's time to pay, right? <laughs> Some of y'all going, no, not really. It don't mean that. You can, they, give you, they got a grace period and, you can, you know, and then you could litigate it. Hey, look at me now. Pay the bill. Okay. So he says, hey, it's time to pay. And so then he goes on to say, and when he began to settle accounts, so he starts figuring out what everybody owes him. And now we know how this works because we do it with our spouses all the time. Well, you owe me. Well, you did this. So he's settling the accounts, what everybody owes him. And one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, let me stop right here because... I need you to understand how much that is. Um, some commentators say that it's uh, an unmeasurable amount of money. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I started looking at some scholars to try to figure out what that was. And, and in the Old Testament, it talks at one point in time about Solomon receiving 666 talents. And so that's a smaller number. That's why I want to kind of do that number just to expound on how big this is. So 666 talents. I know that's a terrible number. Some of y'all just went, 666, he said that in church. 666 talents. And so the equivalent of that, 666 talents, y'all listen to me, young people, in dollar bills is $287 million. You got it? 666 talents. 287 million million dollars and this brother comes with a debt of 10,000 talents you say how much is that no I don't know nobody knows it's, it's so much money I, listen I don't know what this brother did or what he bought or how the I don't know what the interest was on, but he bound to had a credit card So he says, he comes to him and he owes him 10,000 talents. Verse 25, it says, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold, his wife, his children, and all that he had, and that the payment be made. Now, the payment couldn't be made, but the reality is, this is a story Jesus is telling to prove a point. But what Jesus is saying in this passage of Scripture is he couldn't pay the debt off, and so the master said, I'm going to take I'm going to take that which is most important to you, which is basically your whole life. You, your family, and everything. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell all y'all. So watch what happens. When he finds out that he's about to be sold, him and his family, the servant therefore, verse 26, therefore he fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Well, look at you. You ain't paying all. But it wasn't the fact that he was paying all that caught the heartstrings of the master. It was the fact that he humbled himself and he pleaded with the master for forgiveness. He pleaded with the master for time and patience. 
And so watch what the Bible says that the master did. Well, how did he respond? Verse 27, it says, The master of that servant was moved with compassion, which is he had mercy on him. He did not give him what he deserved. He had mercy on him, and he released him, and he forgave him the debt. Ooh, son. That's a lot of debt forgiven. Amen? Let me, let me just... I'm sure he probably walked away after he was forgiven that debt and he walked away and he said, well, that worked pretty good. I, I, how many of y'all think he walked away with a frown on his face going, well, escape one on that one or, well, you know, I guess that's all right. I mean, I'll take it how I can get it. No. I bet you money he didn't walk away. I bet whenever he got up from his knees, I, I, son, I bet he was so excited inside. I mean, how excited would you be if the bank called you and said, oh, I'll, I'll just turn it on myself, all right? The bank called Brother Casey and said, Brother Casey, um, your, your, your whole payment on your house is up. It's time for you to pay. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean y'all love on me when you pay me and everything. You pay me nice, but I'm going to tell you, I can't pay off my house today. Hello, somebody. Now, now, if you want to cut me a check for it, I'll take it and I'll pay it off. But I'm just saying, I can't. And so, so they would come and they say, well, I say, wait a minute. I, I, don't, I don't have the money to pay that right now. I, I, please, I mean, I've got a wife. I've got more kids than I can count. I mean, I, I, I just don't need to do this right now. And, and, and so they said, I'll tell you what, Mr. Johnson. We're, going, we're just going to sell the house. You're going to have to find some else. We're going to sell. I, and I beg, I beg. I, I get on my knees. I go to the bank. And I'm begging. In front of everybody, I'm begging. And finally, they said, all right, Mr. Johnson, all right, that's enough, that's enough. We can see that you've humbled yourself and you're very sincere. So what we're going to do is we're going to cancel all the debt. We're just going to cancel all that debt. I, I'd, be, I'd be walking away, ooh, son, I'd, ooh. I'd be walking away having a spell, you hear me? Woo, I'd be singing, I'd be singing my favorite hymn, whichever one it is, I'd be singing it. I'd be, I'd be, I'd call Dee and say, Dee, you are not, baby, let's celebrate. You are not going to believe. We're going out to eat tonight because we don't have to pay that house note this month. And so I'd be so excited. And I'm sure that he was so grateful and so excited that his debt was paid off. But then watch this. Verse 29. You're not going to convince me that he was ticked off when he left. He was excited when he left. But verse 29. So his fellow servant, no, 28. But that servant went out, and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, he done, obviously, he'd been getting money from the chief, and he'd been letting others borrow, and now others owe him. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so he says he goes out, and he finds one of the other servants that owes him a hundred denarii. Now, he just got forgiven of an... Uh, just an innumerable amount of money, and this guy comes to him and owes him some denarii, which that amount is equivalent to about $12,000. So somebody else owes him $12,000. And so he laid his hands on him. Oh, no, he didn't. I mean, he put his hands on somebody. And then the Bible goes on and says, not only lay his hands on him, he took him by the throat. Y'all don't read this stuff the same way I read it. I, I, I read it, I read it like, he, man, I read it like this. And me, anybody want to volunteer? I mean, I read it like he got him up here and said, you owe me $12,000. You about to pay me this. And, and so what does a man do? Obviously, he don't punch him out. I mean, because that's not in the Bible. But that would have been your story, but that wasn't his story. So what did he do? He, he, he puts his hands on him, puts his hand on his throat, and he said, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant, watch this. His fellow servant did the same thing he did to the master. He fell down at his feet and he begged him. And he said, have patience with me and I will pay you all. It was a payable amount too, by the way. And the other guy's amount was not payable in reality. And so... Verse 30, it says, And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So what did he do? He didn't have compassion. He didn't have mercy on him. He threw him in jail. 
He had just been forgiven of all this debt, and yet he turned around and threw this man in jail. But watch this. So when his fellow servants, when the other brothers saw it, now it's quite possible that the other brothers owed him money too. I mean, he's acquired a whole lot of debt to the master, right? And he's already, we see where he's loaned somebody some money. So it's possible that the servants are looking and going, uh, I owe that brother $5,000. And so they didn't like the way it was handled. And so they go and they say to the master. So when his fellow servants saw that had been done, they were very grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done. And then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. That's strong language. You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? In other words, should you not have done likewise what was done to you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the for, uh, uh, fortunerers until he should pay all that was due to him so my heavenly Father, listen to this, my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart, who, from his, do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now, that's the story. Now, two things I want to show you in this passage of Scripture real quick, real briefly, so pay attention. Number one, I want you to just walk back and pay attention to the unpayable debt that cost the master. See, the servant owed a debt that he could not pay. And it cost the master to let him off the hook. Say, preacher, why does that matter to me? I, I'm, I don't even owe anybody right now. I'm debt free. Here's why it matters. Because you owed a debt one time you could not pay. And it cost the master to pay your debt. And the master, the, the price that was paid for the master, uh, for your debt, was the master sent. Listen, he sent his one and only son. Listen, not his one out of 50, but his one and only son he sent to this earth to die to pay your debt. A debt that was unpayable by you. It's not like you needed, listen, it's not like your debt was that you stole a piece of bubble gum when you were seven and that was the worst thing that you've ever done in your life. It's worse than that. It's, it's based on what the Scripture says. And the Scripture says your debt is that you are an enemy of God. You, listen, and this sounds so terrible and we don't like it, but in our human flesh, in our sinful nature, we hate God. We hate Him, and we hate His ways. That's who we are. And for that, we have a debt that we cannot pay. But the Master paid the debt for us when He sent His Son Jesus to die. So, so notice that the Master, it cost Him to pay that debt. Number two, I want you to notice this. Our forgiveness to others is rooted in how we have been forgiven. See, he had been forgiven a great debt that he could not pay. And because he had been forgiven of a debt that he could not pay, he should have poured out that same kind of forgiveness on other people. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us. You ha Listen, remember the story of the lady who, who came in and she anointed Jesus and she was weeping all over Jesus and she was, listen, she was loving on Jesus and you remember the religious leaders, they were ticked off that she was doing, are y'all alive? They were ticked off that she was doing that. And Jesus said she's been forgiven much, so she loves much. When you truly come to the place to where you've been forgiven much, and you know how much you've been forgiven, you love much. He said, preacher, I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, it's a hard time forgiving people for the things they've done. They've done some terrible things to me. Listen to me carefully. Please, please hear me. I am in no way, shape, or form dismissing what some, what evil someone has done to you because they shouldn't have done it. They should not have done it. No way, no how. But that still does not mean that God's not calling us to forgive them. You don't have to have breakfast with them every day. You don't have to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we hear stories about that, and we're, we're, we're in awe of those stories. 
But sometimes for us, it's just it's forgiving them, even though it may not mean being with them all the time, but forgiving them. Jesus calls us to forgive. I've heard it said like this before, and I think I've preached this here before, but, but, but listen to me. You, you don't remember last week, so just listen to this. Um, if what they've done to you is worse than what you did to Jesus, then you don't have to forgive them. But the reality is, what anyone has done to you is not worse than what we've all done to Jesus. We've mocked him. We've spit in his face. We've, we've, we've treated him horrible as if he's some cruel God, some unfair, unjust God. And all he ever did was love us enough to send his only son to pay a debt we couldn't pay. Say, preacher, how, how can I do that? Well, I, I'm going to leave you with this quote, and I want you to hear me. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, let us go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven. Do you agree with that? Put your, put your eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on the cross and the blood of Christ to learn how to be forgiven. But then he extends that quote by saying this. And then let us linger there to learn how to forgive others. Let us, let us look upon the cross of Calvary to learn what it's like to be forgiven and then let us stay there and look at the cross even more that we might learn how to forgive others the way Jesus has forgiven us. I wish I could tell you that's as easy to do as it is for me to preach. But just because it isn't easy doesn't mean it's not biblical. And that's what Jesus has called us to do. See, I'm convinced that a person who's living a me-first lifestyle they're desperately trying. They're not perfect at this thing called forgiveness, but they're striving to be the best forgiver that they could ever possibly be because Jesus forgave them of all of their sins. See, here's what I know. I know that our churches are filled with people on a weekly basis. And in the midst of the crowd of those people, there are folks who truly have come to the realization of what forgiveness is. Because they've recognized their sin and how their sin separates them from God. But God loved them enough to send Jesus to die for them and they put their faith and trust in Jesus. So now they know what forgiveness is, right? And so now they can learn to forgive other people the way Jesus has forgiven them. But I also believe that our churches are filled every week with people who do not know what forgiveness is. And the reason they don't know what forgiveness is is because they've never been to the cross themselves. They've never put their faith and trust in Jesus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to me real carefully because I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or nothing like that. I love you with all of my heart. Even if you're visiting, I love you and I don't even know you, but listen to me, I will not hide the truth from you. The truth is, one day all of us are going to stand before the Lord God and we're going to be judged for what we did to Jesus. You don't like people judging you now? Wait till you get to heaven because we're going to be judged. Now, if you're a Christian... You've already been judged at the cross. Amen? We'll be held accountable for what we do with what Jesus has given us, but we'll not be judged for our sin because it's already been dealt with. But listen to me carefully. You don't know Jesus. You, you listen. You're going to stand before him one day and be judged. And the only way to escape the judgment for those who don't know Jesus is by trusting Jesus, being forgiven by Jesus. Now, Here's what I also know. I also know that there's not a sermon that's good enough that can make you do that. I do know that. I try my best to preach some good ones. I heard, I heard Johnny Hunt preach two good ones yesterday. I mean, it's just good to me. But his sermons don't save, and nor do mine. But the Spirit of God draws people to be saved. How does he do that? Through the power of the preaching of the Word of God. And today, some of you, just to slice through the garbage, you need to be saved. To put your faith in Jesus and be forgiven that you might forgive other people. Some of you, you've already been forgiven by Jesus, but you're struggling to forgive other people. All I'm going to ask you to do today is to just walk back to the cross. Walk back to the place where Jesus saved you. And surely, that'll help you forgive other people. Amen.